Sergeant Grays. All right. That was a successful second detonation. All teams hold positions and wait for the cavalry to get here. I said over the radio. It was only a second before I got an acknowledgement from Team B. God, remind me to never be this close to a nuclear detonation again, Sarge. Came the word from one of the Marines as he put a hand on the wall of the vent to steady himself. I couldn't help but agree with him on that account. Minimum safe distance or not, that nuke still packed a punch that made several Marines almost fall over from the shockwave alone. I nodded. You can ask me to remind you all you want, but that's not going to stop Command from doing it again if they wanted to. His face got a bit paler. I switched my radio frequency over to the Command one. Command, be advised. All objectives complete, and we are a go for phase two. My radio crackled to life for a second before I heard command. Copy that. The mech boarding party's ETA is five minutes. Hold positions. Wilco command, I said before turning back to my marines. So, anyone want to bet how long it's going to take them to take the bridge? The air was suddenly filled with various marines shouting out their guesses. Twenty-five minutes, shouted one. Forty-seven minutes exactly shouted another. It warmed my cold, dead heart to hear my marines being so passionate about something like this. It really was an excellent bonding activity that would have been more fun if we could see the boarding action itself. I was about to open my mouth to give my guess when my radio suddenly crackled to life. Put me down for twenty minutes, said an extremely familiar voice. I did a double take. Major Morrow, is that you? A loud bark of laughter came from the radio. You can bet your ass that it's me. Did you really think that you could go a single mission without me showing up eventually? He asked. Major Morrow and I had some history. Over the past 15 years or so, we had bumped into each other in various battlefields and deployments. It happened so often that I started to think that someone higher up than both of us was doing it on purpose. I heard that you have control over some of the systems of the ship, he started. Do you by chance have access to the intercom system of the ship? I smiled, knowing exactly where this was going. Yes, we do. Do you have any song requests for this boarding action? Not right now, but we will have a playlist before we get this party started. But when we get there, we would like you to play this message first, then start the music, he said, grinning a grin heard loud and clear through the radio. You got it, boss. Just tell us when. Major Morrow. You got it, boss. Just tell us when. I turned back to my men, grinning a grin that they wouldn't even be able to see. All right, boys. Our ETA is now four minutes. Get your gear ready to go and start brainstorming a playlist. I got a variety of acknowledgments from the 20 men in the spacecraft with me as they started to run final diagnostics on their mechs. Not like they needed it. The mechs were a marvel of human engineering, with various weapon systems that can be switched out on the fly, the most popular of which was referred to as the Bolter. And for good reason. It was a belt-fed behemoth that was integrated into the arm of the mech, below the wrist so that one could still maintain function of that hand. It fired rounds roughly twice the size of a person, and could easily overpenetrate the most heavily armored mech suits available to civilians. But these weren't civilian mechs that we were rocking. These were the most advanced military version that humanity had, and it showed. There was radar, sonar, optics, and sensors that could see through the entire light spectrum the most advanced reactive armor that we had developed, and even a point defense system that could be used to destroy incoming explosives before they could explode, all run by a very limited virtual intelligence. Hell, it could even be commanded to do room clearing, among other things, and carry out its tasks without direct oversight. While we weren't expecting to have to do that, it was nice to know that it was an option. I got us a playlist, boss, said one of the men turning to me as he made sure he was topped off on ammo. Without asking, he sent the playlist. I looked at it and smiled. It was filled to the brim with various songs from before first contact, some of them even being decades or even centuries old. This will do very nicely, I said before switching my radio back on. Sergeant Grays, we have a playlist sending it over to you now. There was silence for a moment before I heard laughter from the sergeant. Oh yeah, this will do nicely. What's your ETA? We're docking right now. It seems like we didn't even need stealth tech to get up close to the ship. I suppose we have you to thank for that, I said. Just doing our job, Major, patching into the intercom system, and done. Your message is playing now.
I smiled once more. Time to deliver the wrath of Terra. High Commander Tussis. Damn those Terrans and their ability to destroy what they shouldn't. As soon as I find them, their suffering will be legendary. I shouted as I watched helplessly from my command chair. The utter chaos that was the bridge caused by the second detonation. I was about to ask a status update from my bridge crew when the intercom system suddenly crackled to life and started to produce noise. Attention crew of the Indomitable Crusade. This is Major Morrow of the United Terran Military. You have attracted the ire of Terra and her people, and rest assured, you will be hunted down until there are no Yaleans left on this ship. There is, however, a way to avoid this fate. If you place your weapons on the ground and put your hands or equivalents in the air, then you will be detained and brought in for questioning. You will also be given a place to stay and three meals a day until this conflict is over. We will only give you one chance to surrender. You can be assured that there won't be a second chance. And with that, the message ended. The entire crew sat dumbfounded. How could they have possibly hacked into our intercom system? And more importantly, what other systems have they breached? I pointed to one of the communications officers. Get a message to the crew at the computer core and tell them to do a hard reset on the whole system. It's the only way to make sure that they're not messing with any other systems. At your command, High Commander, came the response. I was about to give another order when some kind of music started to play over the intercom. It was full of percussion, and what I could only assume was the voices of Terrans. The music was so loud that I could barely hear my own security officer shout something about one of the airlocks being breached and the armored Terrans that came flooding out of it. I immediately pulled up the security footage from that part of the ship, just quickly enough to see about twenty heavily armed and armored Terrans rush out of the airlock, putting a single kinetic slug into the skull of any crew member that did not comply with their demands. I felt my blood chill at the sight. Ancestors preserve us. Major Morrow. We all felt the shuttle shudder for a moment as the ship attached itself to the indomitable crusade. Those that weren't already standing stood up as the ship went from Terran standard to Yalayan standard atmosphere. Not that there was enough of a difference for either the indomitable crusade or our shuttle to be damaged by not doing this. But like the old Terran saying goes, better safe than sorry. The airlock went through its cycling process before the inner door was promptly kicked open by one of my men. We were immediately buffeted by the loud music that Sergeant Grays was pumping into the ship before our mechs automatically filtered out the excess noise. Despite this, I could hear some of my men singing along to the vocals of some of the tracks. So long as they didn't interfere with radio chatter, I let them do what they wanted. There were a few of those praying mantis looking Xenos near the airlock. They looked over to where twenty armed and angry Terrans were pouring out of the airlock. Without fail, they all went for their service pistols, and like I had warned in my previous message, we gunned them down with extreme prejudice. Six bolter rounds and six confirmed kills later, we had cleared the airlock and the adjoining hallways. Clear, I shouted as I turned towards the pre-planned route to the bridge. Be advised, we now have access to the camera system and are looking at your route. You're clear so far. Also, that breach is going in the highlight reel, I heard Sergeant Gray say through the radio. Copy that, Sergeant. Keep us posted about any ambushes that we can avoid, I replied as we started stomping along our predetermined path, occasionally relieving some poor Zeno of the burden that was their head. Wilco Major, it's an honor to see you work, the Sergeant replied, followed by an impressive whistle as we acted like surgeons performing our craft. You mess with Terra or her people. This is what you get. Hi, Commander Tussis. I watched the security feeds in absolute horror as my crew was systematically slaughtered by the Terrans, all to the beat of their terrifying music. I was about to order my security officer to get a counterboarding operation started, to see that they were already screaming those same orders to their subordinates, desperately trying to be heard over the droning beat of the music. Oh, ancestors, what are we going to do? I thought after watching the Terrans blow through another seven crew members. Scuttling the ship would take the Terrans down and destroy any sensitive information along with it. Some back corner of my mind said, no. I shook my head to try and rid myself of that thought. I will not be dying today. And besides, that would be a last resort of all last resorts. Instead, I pulled up a map of the ship. 
The Terrans had breached relatively close to the bridge, but that left us with options for either delaying their advances or stopping them altogether. I waved over my security officer, who came over quickly. We need to set up ambushes at these sites, I shouted over the music, pointing to several spots on the map. They nodded and shouted back to me. At your command, High Commander. Space battles might be where I excelled, but this was still my ship, and if I had my way, I would drive these vermin from it. Major Morrow, we were making good time through the ship, but to say that we were without problems would be a lie. Due to the shifty nature of these bug-looking bastards, we had to take our time and clear each individual door and room as we went along. Otherwise, there was a possibility of being ambushed and killed before we could fulfill our mission. We were taking some wins, however. Not every Yulayan we came across was so fanatical that they couldn't be coerced into surrendering. Hell, we even managed to make it into the double digits of POWs. But most didn't want to be taken alive. I had just breached one of the rooms only to find a single Yulayan standing in the middle of the room, plasma pistol near the door, trembling something fierce as they held their hands above their head. Please don't shoot, they pleaded. Before I could respond, my mech was brained by another Yulayan holding a fire extinguisher just outside of my vision. I stumbled forward before finally falling to the ground. As I rolled to face my aggressors, they both pulled out knives from pouches on their abdomen jumped on me and started wildly slashing at my mech. Shit, I shouted as I was ganged up on. Luckily, this mech was not only designed to be used in war, it was also capable of doing hand-to-hand -hand combat as effectively as any regular Marine is. I grabbed the knife hand of the one on my left and squeezed until I could hear its carapace start to crack, and a scream sounded from its mandibles. A blade shot from my wrist like that one character from that one video game franchise that really should have stopped a century ago. I rapidly inserted the knife into its chest area until it wouldn't move anymore, covering the mech in the sickly green blood of their kind. I was going to turn to my second aggressor when its head was suddenly turned to mist by a single shot from one of my squad mates' bolter. You broke yet, sir? he asked, offering me his hand. Not in a million years, I responded as I checked the diagnostic system of the mech. Only a few minor breaches in the outer layer, nothing that would take me out of the fight just yet. I reached up and took his hand as he pulled me up from my prone position. Thanks for the assist, I said, putting the knife back where it came from. Just looking out for my own sir, he replied. I nodded at that. We both finished clearing the room and then went on to the next one. We did this for another five minutes or so before we came across a sealed bulkhead. I motioned over to our hard breacher to put some charges on it when I heard my radio crackle to life once again. Be advised. There is a large contingent of about 40 hostiles on the other side of that bulkhead. They are all armed with heavy weaponry straight from the armory, came the voice of the sergeant. I stopped just short of the bulkhead, scanning the area warily for any traps on this side of the bulkhead. Copy that. Is there any way around? I asked. Unfortunately not, unless you want to go 20 minutes out of your way, he replied. Shit. Any suggestions? I asked to both him and my team. A smart flashbang could be useful here. Throw it up into the vents and maneuver it to the hallway just outside of the bulkhead while we breach it, came the suggestion from one of my men. Damn good idea, I shouted as I pulled a smart flashbang out of a compartment on my mech. Sergeant, if you can open the vent access on both sides of the bulkhead, we can get these Xenos to God with same-day shipping. Two men started to put breaching charges onto the bulkhead to blow it open. You got it, Major. Vent access in 3, 2, 1. And with that, the vent overhead slid open as I chucked the smart flashbang into the vent, its miniature thrusters propelling it beyond our sight and down the vent system towards the enemy. It wasn't long before we heard a loud bang on the other side, followed rather quickly by the explosive of the breaching charges that were placed on the bulkhead, blowing it from its tracks and into two Yulayans, crushing them under the weight of it. It didn't take long for us to dispatch the remaining 38 hostiles and clear the rest of the hallway. Only three more bulkheads to go.